he gave us an ability to communicate. And so uh, God is a God who communicates. As a matter of fact, the triune Godhead said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. And God gave us an ability to communicate, an ability to communicate on a level that the animal realm uh, cannot I realize that animals can communicate. They can send, uh, a dog can bark, a bird can chirp, a whale can make whatever noise he makes, and animals do have a way of communicating, but not on the level that people can communicate. A matter of fact, people can think on a level far above the animal realm. People can think in the abstract uh, a dog can never uh, do a multiplication table. You know, a, a dog is, is just not going to uh, think in the abstract, and animals can't communicate in the abstract. People can, because God gave us that ability. He gave us an ability to talk. He gave us an ability to uh, listen, to socialize. They say that 70% of our day is spent in communication. Most of that is spent in listening. Um, some have said, and I think these percentages might vary, but 9% in writing, 16% in reading, 30% in speaking, 45% in listening, adding up to 70%. Of course, those numbers will differ. Some read more than they speak. Others speak more than they read. Some don't read at all. Uh, others uh, do some writing. And, of course, nowadays with email, uh, we do a lot of communication via email. And um, communication, though, is simply sharing in one another's lives. That's what it involves. It involves sharing, it involves input, it involves an interchange of thoughts and feelings. Communication is an interchange of thoughts and feelings. It's my opinion that generally uh, men need to work at communication more than women. I would say it's been my observation that women generally are more verbal than men are. Uh, that was true uh, when it came to our children. Our girls talked more than our boy did, and our boy wants to play with his cars, and the girls like to play games that involves talking, and, you know, even if it's with a doll. But they like to communicate, and, and I think it's part of the female gender. I think men need to learn how to talk more Women need to learn how to talk less uh, as a general rule. Now, that's not always the case. I was just speaking to my friend Gil about an individual that likes to talk and talks and talks and talks and talks, and the wife doesn't talk. And so it, it, there are differences here, but generally, men need to learn how to open up and talk more. Women need to sometimes uh, restrain themselves and talk less. You know, the Bible says... Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. And so sometimes we need to speak less and listen more. God gave us two ears and one mouth, and maybe we need to use the ears a little bit more uh, than we do the mouth. But communication is a vital aspect to human relationships. And um, in James chapter 3, God talks about the tongue and how the tongue is powerful. And I'd like us to notice this um, third chapter. How about if we begin with verse 1? So sometimes it just takes a, a minute to uh, respond. Uh, my little clicker here for our PowerPoint. Notice James 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That basically means don't everybody aspire to be a teacher. And here it means a, a Bible teacher, a religious teacher, a spiritual teacher. Don't everybody desire, aspire, pursue the ministry. God says don't do it. Don't every man 
be not many masters. Don't everybody claim to be a, a, uh, a master of uh, theology. Don't everybody uh, 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 claim to be a, a, uh, a master of doctrine, knowing that when you open your mouth and communicate, God is going to hold you accountable for what you teach. God is going to hold me accountable for what I preach. If what I preach is not accurate, if it's not true to the text, I'm going to give a strict, uh, be given a strict evaluation and, and judgment, knowing that I'm going to receive a greater condemnation than those who aren't Bible teachers. So God's giving us a warning here. Don't everybody aspire to be a, a Bible teacher, knowing that we will receive a more strict evaluation. Uh, notice verse 2. For in many things we offend all. In other words, all of us sin in different ways. But he says, if any man offend not in word, if we don't stumble in what we say, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So if you can control your mouth, God says you can control everything else because the mouth is usually the first place to manifest a problem. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And usually our, what we say uh, gets us into trouble. Uh, what we say reveals a problem. And uh, if we're able to control that little member, the Bible says you're mature and you're able to bridle the whole body. You can control your physical body if you can control your mouth. But notice now in verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor or the captain listeth. Wherever he wants to go, he just turns that rudder. Even so the tongue is a little member. And boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And so here he talks about the tongue and its power. And the Bible says in Proverbs that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. So what does the tongue have power to do? Give me an answer. What do we do uh, with our tongue? It's got power. Uh, it can uplift or destroy. Yeah, the tongue has that power. Anybody else? With our tongue, we can, Andre? We can encourage like Barnabas with our tongue. What else? What is that? We can praise God with our tongue. Yes. We could discourage with our tongue. Russ. We could confuse with our tongue. Anybody else? How about you guys? The tongue is power. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What does that mean? Mara. We could lie with our tongue to protect self and mislead people. Anybody else? Eric? We could preach the word with our tongue. Tim? We can create reality. Yeah, you know, the Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so you confess Christ and you will be saved. And so that's a reality. <laughs> Salvation's a reality. But of course, it involves more than just the tongue. It involves the heart, of course. Uh, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now, God is the one who did create reality with his tongue in the sense that he spoke and the universe came into existence. But you know, with our tongue, we can, like, like uh, Donovan said, we could discourage somebody and we create the reality of discouragement in their life. Or with the tongue, we can impart truth and build a life and change a home. And that's reality, <laughs> right? And so uh, life changes because of what we say. Now, Russ, you were going to say something, I think. Did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Uh, the tongue, with the tongue, we can evangelize. With the tongue, we can give comfort. With the tongue, we can ruin a person's reputation. 
With a tongue, we can split a church. With a tongue, we could break a heart. With a tongue, we could save a life. And so, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Russ? Yeah. And, uh, of course, we could speak a, a word that uh, against God, which is what we'd never want to do with our tongue. For every idle word shall men give an account thereof in the day of judgment, Jesus said in Matthew twelve thirty six. And so imagine that every idle word we will give an account. Now, notice in our text here regarding the tongue, the tongue has two powers that I want you to notice. The tongue has, first of all, the power to direct. And both of my points begin with D, okay? The tongue, so guess what the next one is? The tongue has power to direct, and then it has the power to destroy, right? Let's look at the power to direct. We, we read in verses 1 and 2 that the tongue has the power to direct others. Therefore, its use is very serious. He says in verse 1, Don't everybody aspire to be a master, a teacher of the Word of God, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And so the, the, there's power in the tongue to direct the lives of others. I think of a fellow named uh, William Kimball. Anybody know who William Kimball is? April 21st, 1855. William Kimball led D.L. Moody to the Lord in a Boston shoe store. And D.L. Moody then became one of the greatest preachers in America's history in terms of the numbers of people he was able to reach with the gospel. And one man, the power of the tongue, was able to direct this man, D.L. Moody, to the Lord. He got saved, and then that man became a mighty evangelist. And so the tongue has power, power to direct others, but also power to direct your own life. Even though its size is small, notice he says in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, a little rudder? A bridle would weigh about a pound. A one-pound bit in the horse's mouth turns that 500-plus pound animal, and, uh, and all it is a little thing, but that little thing directs that big beast. And then you think of a ship, and all it is is that little helm in the back of that ocean vessel that when you turn it, this way, the ship goes to the right, turn it this way, it goes to the left. And so the little helm turns that big ocean vessel and the little bit turns that big horse. And God is saying that little thing in your mouth will, will determine your whole future and it will direct your whole life. And so it has the power to direct, even though it's small. Not only does it have power to direct, but it has power as we said, to direct others and your own life, but it has power to destroy. Notice verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. The tongue is the world's smallest yet biggest troublemaker. The kids used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's not true, is it? We, know, we all know that, that words do hurt. Now, the tongue is a fire, he says here, and usually a fire starts off small as he says, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And that's where Smokey the Bear comes in, right? Remember? Put out those, those little fires because all it takes is a little kindling and you could burn down an entire forest. Back in the year of 1871, 
They say that a cow kicked over a lantern, and the lantern lit the barn on fire, and the fire spread, leaving 100,000 people homeless, burning 17,500 buildings and destroying them all. 300 people died in all of this in the Chicago fire. In 1871, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. A fire starts off small, but then a fire heat things up and then it defiles, uh, the Bible says here. So is, is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. Uh, your tongue, you use your tongue in a wrong way and you feel filthy all over. It will defile your whole body. The tongue like a fire defiles. Fire defiles. I was driving down 34th Street recently and I noticed a building on 34th that had been burnt. Inside of this house, everything is gone. I was looking at, and, and, and even the outside all melted away and everything. And you look inside and all you see are burnt two by fours. <laughs> everything else has been burned up and destroyed or def anything remaining was defiled. Back when I was about nine or ten years old, my house, our family's house, caught on fire. Fortunately, the family was away on Arch Street in New Britain, Connecticut. Apparently, there was a problem with our TV or the wiring in the TV, and it caused the TV to catch on fire, and it spread and burnt the whole apartment up. Firemen went in and they, of course, sprayed their hoses and they put out the fire so the whole building didn't burn down. But we went back to try to salvage some of our belongings and I lost every single toy. Anything that was left, my mother's oil paintings and things that were rema had remained, were all defiled. Uh, they were ruined by the heat and they were defiled by the smoke damage. They were defiled by the water when they were attempting to put out the fire and it seemed like we had to buy, every, we had to start over, basically. That's when we moved into the projects of New Britain, Connecticut. and That's where, when I met Tito, actually, way back then. And uh, it was because of the fire. And, uh, but we lost it all. It, what wasn't burned up was defiled. Well, the tongue defiles, the Bible says. It'll stain, it'll dirty, it'll putrefy everything about our life. We have to be careful how we use it. Then a fire spreads. He describes it setting on fire the course of nature. And then he describes it as it itself being set on fire of hell. And oftentimes there are demonic forces, demonic forces at work that put thoughts in our head. And I do believe that because remember the Lord Jesus rebuked Peter, said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Satan literally put a thought in, Satan, in Peter's head. And Peter uttered something that Jesus had to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. I believe that the demonic forces can put thoughts in our head that result in something happening in our heart and issuing forth out of our mouth that ends up hurting many people and, and destroying a lot of good. And so there is a, a problem with the tongue, and it has the power to destroy. In verse 7, he goes on to say, For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And so they could tame any kind of animal. They could tame seals and lions and tigers. They could tame monkeys and they could tame dogs and cats and rodents and birds. And you name it. Uh, have you ever been to one of those shows and you see all the tricks that a dog can do and you see all that these animals can do? I mean, they could charm snakes. They could tame all kinds of animals. But you know what the Bible says? The tongue... Can no man tame? Huh. Isn't that something? We can tame anything we want, but we can't tame the tongue. Why? Because the tongue is simply a reflection of the heart. And the heart can only be tamed by God. And so 
God can tame the tongue, but man cannot. So if you have a, a tongue problem, it's because you have a heart problem. And the only one who can help you is the Lord. Seek him. His salvation is where it all begins. And so sometime our tongue is inconsistent. Uh, he says there in verse uh, 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude or in the image of God. So one minute we could be praising God at church, next minute we could be cursing somebody out who is made in the image and likeness of God. He says, this ought not to be. He says, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Our tongue is sometimes like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know. Our tongue is sometimes one way and then sometimes another way. And he says there ought to be a consistency. Verse 11, doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? No, it can only bear figs. Either a vine figs? No, a vine's going to bear grapes, not figs. And so no fountain can yield both salt water and fresh. Well, that's true. And the point in that illustration is that there ought to be consistency in our mouth. That's why the psalmist said, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Psalm 141, verse 3. And you all know Ephesians 4.29. Let no, say it with me, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And so very good. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus said, Matthew 12.34. And so our prayer uh, needs to be, Lord, uh, cleanse my heart so that my mouth will be all that it should be. So as we think about marriage and we think about the tongue, realize this, that your tongue has the power to direct your home. It has a power to, to be a real blessing. But on the other hand, it has a power to destroy your family, tear apart your relationships, ruin your children, ruin your relationship with your mate. And so we have to say to God, God, take charge of my tongue. Well, let's move on. Uh, this is just a little bit about that passage in James. Hope you didn't need all that. The importance of the tongue. Why should I communicate with my spouse? Well, without communication, relationships go undeveloped. A relationship is only developed to the degree that you communicate. Is that not true? I mean, think about God for a minute. Do you have a good relationship with God if you never communicate with God? No. Does God have a good relationship with you if he never communicates with you? No. There has to be communication in order for us to have a good relationship with the Lord. The same is true in any relationship. If we don't communicate in a right way, there's going to be problems. And so without communication, relationships go undeveloped and feelings and desires go unshared. Without communication, feelings and desires go unshared. And this can become a problem because if your spouse cannot open up and talk to you, that will lead toward the temptation of your spouse opening up to somebody else at work. Somebody on the job who will give in listening ear. Sometimes it's the opposite sex. You know, sometimes the wife's husband doesn't uh, communicate and they don't talk. And so she wants to talk. So she ends up talking to people at work and relationships get developed because of it. And before you know it, there's problems. And so there has to be communication so that, so especially for the woman... So that feelings and desires could be shared and you, you, you greatly decrease the risk of opening the door for intimate communication outside of the marriage, which might lead to problems. But also, without communication, problems go unsolved. That's why Jesus says that if your brother has ought against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he will hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And, and, and so the Lord says that if you have a problem, communicate. Go up to the person, talk to the person. Because if you fail to, you fail to obey Jesus Christ, and it ends up creating a great church problem. And so we have to communicate and leave the, the door open for communication, otherwise the problem cannot get resolved. We have to deal with problems biblically. And biblical resolution of problems doesn't involve just saying, well, time will heal. Time does help us forget, especially the older you get, the more you forget. But time is not the healer. You need to get the, the problem out and talk it out and love and, and, and get it resolved. So it, communication is vitally important in a marriage. How do we talk? How do we communicate? The method of communication involves two things, careful listening and careful speaking. Hey, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Even Vlad could remember that, right? He sees the pictures up there. Uh, careful listening, careful speaking. That's communication. Without both, you don't have communication. You have to do both. Now notice, let's talk first about careful listening. As I said before, God tells us, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Proverbs says that he who answers a matter before he hears it, it shall be counted a folly and a shame unto him. So before we answer, we've got to listen, right? Sometimes we speak before we listen, or sometimes we engage the tongue before we engage the brain. And we need to listen and think and then talk. So it involves careful listening. As we listen carefully, we need to listen without interruption. Listen without interruption. Uh, if somebody's speaking to you, stick to the subject. Don't change the subject. Many people, to avoid communication, just change the subject. Move on to something else. But if, so, if, but if it's important enough for somebody to talk to you about it, it's important enough to listen to it. Don't change the subject. Talk about the matter at hand. It's rude. To just change this, to divert the attention away from an issue that needs to be addressed. And then don't interject a quick solution. A lot of times we'll hear a problem and before we hear the whole problem and hear both sides of the issue, we're very quick to say, well, this is what has to be done. And sometimes you just need to hear the whole story and then think about it and pray about it and then offer solutions. But oftentimes, we're just quick to give a solution before we've really heard the entire problem. Then number three, don't speak abruptly without thinking first. Engage the brain before you engage the tongue. And so a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And we need to make sure that we think first before we speak. Now, there's more to communication. There's more to communication than just spoken words. Communication also involves written communication, as we said, cards. You could say a lot in notes, in cards, in letters. But communication also involves uh, facial expression. Uh, you communicate a lot by your expression, do you not? I mean, you could say the right words, but if your countenance shows something just the opposite... I think they're going to pay more attention to what you look like than what you said. Like you have somebody over and, you know, you're giving them a, a dish and they taste the food and, and, and it's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, your face just said more than your words did, right? <laughs> and so there's, there's, there's more to communication than just by what you say. Your face sh says a lot. Uh, gestures. You know, uh, you know, gestures when you, when you, and I like using gestures, and I, and I like using my hands, and I must be part Italian or something. But um, gestures communicate. Tone of voice communicates. Not only what you say, but how you say it. Your tone and your decibel level uh, communicate. 
As I've shared with you before, you might say to your spouse, I love you, honey. And that sounds good, but you could also say it like this, I love you, honey. Now, I said the same words, but the way I said them communicated, didn't it? it? Communicated two different messages. So it's not only what we say, but it's how we say it that matters. Sometimes, um, and I think this is a means of communication, non-response. Non-response means that you are communicating to the other person that what they expected of you is not important or what they wanted you to understand is not important, doesn't matter. And, um, and that, you know, by your non-response, you're communicating too. I, you know, you're communicating like, I don't have time for you or uh, I'm busy or uh, what you're saying is not important. And so we have to make sure that our response is, is appropriate and, and, and biblical. But... Uh, Let's move on. Listen without interruption. Listen without divided attention. In Proverbs chapter 4, getting just a little bit of noise here. Proverbs chapter 4, listen to what uh, the book of wisdom has to say about the use of the tongue in verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. And so that sounds to me like the father is saying to the son, listen carefully to what I'm saying. Incline means to bend down. You know, it's like this. Listen carefully. Incline your ear to the man of wisdom, uh, to what he's trying to say. Now, we could apply that in a lot of ways. You parents wish your kids would do that, don't you? That when you say something, I'm just going to take this off to try to eliminate that noise. Um, when you communicate something to your children, uh, you want them to incline their ear. You want them to listen carefully. And every time you guys come to church, especially the teens, try to listen carefully because, you know, yeah, I know you got a lot on your mind and I know there's, you know, you're thinking about, I'm going to do this later and I need to get that going this week. And sometimes we waste a lot of our life because we're not careful listeners. We have to listen without divided attention. They say that the average person can speak 120 to 180 words a minute. I can't do that, but some can. But they say that the average person can think four or, times, four or five times that rate. So you could think at least four times faster than, than, than you can speak. Therefore, the mind tends to really, you know, shoot around. And that's why we have to listen better. Uh, so that we catch what's being said. If you're not careful, your attention will wander, and that is not good in marriage. We have to respect each other, and especially, let me talk to the men. Men, this is primarily our problem, that we don't listen well enough, because we're thinking about something else. And uh, we need to respect our wives and, and our children and listen to what they say. And then uh, C, listen to understand not only what is said, but what is meant by what is said. Listen to understand. My former pastor, Tim Jordan, made this statement once, and I wrote it down. He said, take a look at the question or problem at hand from the other person's point of view. You may not agree with it. You may not agree with their point of view, but you should accurately understand it. And so as you're listening to your spouse, try to listen from their perspective and see where they're coming from and try to understand not only what is said, but what is meant by what is said, because often the two are not the same. Sometimes you might need to ask questions to clarify uh, and to help you understand what they mean by what they said and unloaded questions, I, I might say. But... Um, but, but we need to carefully listen to people. Um, thank you. Maybe it'll work now, Nathan. Maybe it'll finally work. Um, communication involves careful listening. Secondly, careful speaking. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible uses a, a little phrase that is so powerful. It says, speaking the truth in love. 
Just that little phrase, speaking the truth in love. When it comes to careful speaking, we have to, and this is basic, but we've got to speak. <laughs> the method of communication, we have to speak. Um, we cannot give the silent treatment. That is not good. Um, Proverbs 18. Well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, when it comes to the silent treatment, you know, sometimes we get revenge when we have a problem. And rather than addressing the problem, we zip the lip and we don't talk because we're bitter. Now, sometimes it's sometimes you've got to control your emotions and it's better not to speak till your emotions are under control. But eventually you've got to talk and you've got to speak. You cannot give the silent treatment and remain like that and expect the problem to heal itself. And also... Don't assume that the other person knows what you want or what you need. Don't make assumptions. I find, now maybe this has been your experience too, but I find that if we fail to communicate with each other in the home or in a church, what often ends up happening is people start getting suspicious about each other. Yeah, actually the old devil starts stirring up suspicions in the minds of congregants uh, about each other that are really unfounded and not true, but you have no way of knowing that because you haven't talked to that person in a month. And so, folks, we just have to learn how to talk more and how to listen better. But don't assume the other person knows what you want or need and then get hurt feelings because they didn't meet your need. You failed to communicate. You failed to talk. And sometimes, well, she should know I have this need, or he should know I wanted that. Well, we're, we don't always know. Now, this is particularly helpful for the ladies, because sometimes the lady makes assumptions that, that are true from her perspective, because women are more thinking in certain areas, uh, and do function more on feelings and emotions where the man, he has no foggy idea what you expect from him. And you're thinking he ought to know. But, you know, my friends, we need to communicate and make sure the other person knows rather than assuming they know or, or uh, thinking uh, they should have known. We have to speak. And then number three, make it your goal to increase the level of your communication. There are different levels of communication. They move from the lowest to the highest. The lowest would be little cliches and ca casual conversation like, uh, hi, how are you? Good to see you. What does that mean? Well, it's become such a cliche that sometimes it has no meaning. You know, it's just the way in which we greet each other. But then you have the reporting of facts level, which might be a little higher. Well, it's hot today, and tomorrow it's supposed to uh, be even more humid, and maybe a thunder shower, and, you know, you report facts. But then there's a higher level where you share ideas, concepts, opinions, judgments, and, you, and, you, and that's a higher level. But then there's another level where you share feelings and emotions, and that is especially important in the marriage relationship. And then there's the highest level of open, honest sharing on a deep personal level where you are able to just open up and be transparent. And uh, in a marriage, there needs to be that type of uh, openness. And if, and if your spouse is not this way, you can't force them to be, but but you can be, um, you can open up and communicate. And men, we really need to learn how to do this. Ask God to help you to speak, but not only speak, but speak the truth. The content of communication ought to be truth, not lies, not falsehood, not exaggerations. The Bible says we should speak the truth because we are, do you guys remember a lesson a couple weeks ago? Because we are what? One of another. Members. 
Yeah, members one of another. Now that is true in a church, that we are members one of another, therefore we have to speak the truth, because when we speak a lie, we're actually hurting ourselves and our interconnectedness to each other, but that's especially important in a marriage because you are not only members one of another in a marriage, you're one, the two become one, one in relationship. And uh, if you fail to tell the truth in your marriage, that lie is going to hurt your marriage, your relationship. And because we're one with Christ, we should tell truth because he is truth. We need to be honest and open with each other. Sometimes, uh, and by the way, if you're not honest, God's going to bring it out. I mean, you may pull the wool over your spouse's eyes for a time, but you can't pull the wool over their eyes forever. The truth always has a way of coming out. And uh, it's better to be open. It's better to be honest rather than being found out later uh, to have been a liar. And so make it your habit because otherwise, you know, David tried covering up his adultery, but God brought it out, right? And when he was silent, his bones waxed old through his roaring all the day long for day and night, God's hand was heavy upon him and he was being chastened of the Lord. And so be, be honest, speak the truth to each other and then speak the truth in love. In love. That's the manner of our communication. Speaking the truth in love. Our words should build up. We must always build others up with our mouth. Ask yourself before you say it, is what I am about to say intended to hurt or help? Is it destructive criticism or constructive criticism? If it's intended to help, then the motive is love. If it's intended to hurt, the motive is not love. And so a simple rule of thumb, if it won't build up, shut up, and uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying means to build up. Number two, we must never blow up with our tongue. Build up, don't blow up. We must be careful to pay attention not only to the content of what we say, but to the manner in which we say it. To say the right thing in a wrong way is sin. Sometimes the way we talk speaks so loud the other person doesn't hear what we say because they're focusing more on how we said it. And so, folks, when it comes to communication, I'd have to say that how you say it is just as important or perhaps more important than what you say. Because if what you say isn't said in the right way, they won't catch what you said. They'll catch how you said it. And we need to be very careful there. Make sure that what we say and how we say it match. That it's meant uh, out of love. Loving words, loving manners in which we say the words. Evil speech does two things. Um, Did you get all of this, by the way? You didn't get that? Oh, well. We might just need to press on here. <laughs> Want to advance that mic for me? Yeah, you could just... Uh, We'll go to next. Just hit your enter key. Escape. Well, escape will take it. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. And so sometimes the way we talk speaks so loud the other person doesn't hear what we say. So make sure your manner is proper. Your manner is very vital. Um, Evil speech does two things. Number one, it opens the door for Satan, Ephesians 4.27. He's in the context talking about letting not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And then he talks about the tongue in the next verse. And so if we don't say the right thing in the right way, and if we have that rage within our heart, we open the door for Satan. 
and uh, satanic attacks that come upon a home and come upon a marriage. And also we grieve the Holy Spirit. He says in the context of speaking properly, he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, there are problems when it comes to communication. The source of our problem uh, is the heart. Let's back up a little, Mike, if we can. There we go. Thank you. Those are the four problems that I, that I see uh, as when it comes to communication. Our number one for Jesus uh, said out of the, uh, the heart, the mouth speaks in Matthew 12. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So it's not so much the tongue problem, it's the heart problem. And that's something only God can deal with. We have to pray. We have to ask God, God, guard my heart and change my heart. But also there's the pride problem where our selfish pride keeps us from opening up and becoming vulnerable. Our pride prevents us from admitting when we're wrong, where we can't apologize. And the reason we don't want to apologize is because of our pride. We're thinking, oh, they'll think less of me. Forget about you. Just think about truth. Truth is what matters. And then uh, our pride prevents us from asking for forgiveness and saying words of affection. Like sometimes uh, a person, because of pride, will not say to his spouse, I love you, because somehow that's not manly or whatever. Um, and many times our pride gets in the way. But then there's apathy, where we are deceived into thinking that our communication is not that bad and we believe the lie that this is the way it is, and this is the way it's doomed to remain, and therefore I, we have no desire to change, or we've accepted the society status quo. And by the way, you know, probably one of the greatest influences to detrimentally uh, affect your communication is TV. What people watch on TV and the responses that they're seeing on TV are not the responses you want in your marriage, right? I mean, generally. Uh, most TV programs involve, if there is a husband and wife, uh, uh, we can't assume that. Uh, if there is a husband and wife, the communication is often disrespectful. There, there is often a disregard for each other, a disregard for the husband's uh, headship or disrespect for the wife. It's usually a scene of yelling and screaming and fighting and cursing and lying. And all of this is coming across and you're, you're seeing these response patterns on TV. And I don't care what they say. What you see does affect how you live. I realize there are people who say, I could watch that stuff, that doesn't affect me. You're fooling yourself. If what we saw did not affect our response patterns, why would they spend millions of dollars for a one minute commercial during the Super Bowl? Because they know that what that commercial is gonna provoke a response. The advertisers know that what you see affects how you live. But the other fools don't, you know, they say, well, the kids can view that kind of violence and they could view that kind of behavior and it doesn't affect them. Yes, it does. And so if you want to have a good marriage, you need to either not have a TV or have it under strict control because what you see will affect you. Evil communications do corrupt good manners. Another source of our problem is our differences. Conflicts often occur because of the basic differences with the way men and women think and express themselves. You need to dwell with your wife according to knowledge, but you need to know she's different than you. And sometimes those basic differences uh, create problems in our communication. As I said before, women tend to talk more, men tend to talk not enough. And, uh, and so we need to ask God to help us here. There are other problems that could enter in, such as finances, where you have stresses that 
pressures that come upon you that will that will for, sort of provoke you uh, in your in your talk. Like people argue and fight over finances, how the money is spent, and the goals for the family's finances, in-laws, sex, spiritual needs, personal habits. All of these are, are areas where we can have problems in our communication. And, and you know what I find? I find it's not usually the big things, the big uh, problems that create the, the communication problem. It's sometimes just the little things that we tend to fly off the handle and get upset about something that is really nothing. It's really small and insignificant. But we fly off the handle and now we've got a bigger problem because what I said in response to that little problem has made the matter worse than that problem was. And so we have to make sure that we deal with a problem in a right way. Harmful ways of communicating are when you communicate out of anger. You need to make sure that your anger uh, propels you to a right solution but also that that solution would be expressed in a right way. Uh, qu being quarrelsome, uh, you know, it is better to uh, dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a wide house with a brawling woman. And uh, Proverbs talks about the, the, the woman being like the dripping of the faucet, you know, drip, 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 nonstop, constant, nagging, and that is not biblical communication. Uh, maybe we need to pray more and nag less <laughs> and trust God to begin working in this person's life rather than us trying to force and manipulate uh, the situation. Criticizing. Now, we, we all are critical, and it's, it's good to critique, but we have to be careful that we don't criticize, but that after we've critiqued a situation, that we offer a, a, a biblical solution without uh, just criticizing for the sake of criticizing. Uh, then there's wrong timing, um, where we say the right thing, but it, the timing wasn't right. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Or ignoring the person, or responding without thinking. What do I do to, and don't do to improve my communication? Here's some do's and don'ts. Just write down these, and then we'll be done. First. Identify, confess, and forsake the sin of not communicating with your mate. If you've been failing, then say to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. Help me to be a better talker. Help me to be a better listener. Uh, then don't talk about your problems with other people unless you're seeking advice or counsel. Make, uh, you know, don't take a private matter and make it a public matter unless you try to deal with it personally first. Jesus said, if your brother has an ought against you, you go to him, settle it with him alone, Jesus said, alone. And then number three, talk with the present problem at hand, not the past. Don't dig up the old bones of the past, like the dog that goes and digs up the old bone. Don't dig it out to begin clubbing him with. Uh, deal with the present problem. Thanks, Mike. Avoid using emotionally charged words. And so uh, speak words that, uh, where your emotions are under control. Next, uh, go out on a date once in a while so that you can have dinner together and spend time looking at each other and talking. That's, that's important. I, uh, I like one place on Queens Boulevard, and some people in our church were nice to buy us a Terry and I, a gift certificate to go and eat there, uh, Portofina. So they, they've got some good chow at Portofina. And uh, Terry and I have gone there on a few occasions and just talk. And so that's good. That's been fun and, and very helpful. Then provide an open, permissive, accepting atmosphere. You know, if you want to talk, if you want your husband to talk to you, then be a person that he would like to talk to. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is, this is basic, but if you want to open up communication, be communicable. Uh, be somebody that is more receptive, somebody who's got more of a heart to listen. And, and, uh, and so if we, if we want to open up communication, we need to have an accepting atmosphere. Thanks, Mike. And then uh, when it comes to marriage, compliment each other. 
rather than criticize all the time, compliment and say, uh, boy, that, that looks like a, a nice dress you have there, or boy, that meal was good that you cooked tonight, or, you know, or thanks for that supper tonight, honey, that was good stuff. You know, learn to compliment, and then seek to understand, not just to be understood, uh, seek to understand the situation from the other person's perspective, be courteous, use the words please, thank you, I appreciate that, or I'm sorry, you know, learn how to say those tough words where you got to swallow your pride sometimes, be courteous, and don't let pride keep you from admitting need or when you're wrong. Say, learn how to say the words, I was wrong, please forgive me. And then when you disagree, don't be disagreeable. Uh, we could disagree, and we will disagree, but you can disagree uh, in an agreeable fashion. Number 12, when agreement is not reached, the father or husband as the head of the home must make a careful, correct, considerate decision, and the family must abide by it. And that is really when submission is an issue, right here. Really, submission's a non-issue if you always agree. Isn't that true? I mean, if you always agree, submission's a non-factor. Submission really only comes into play, uh, practically speaking, when there is a difference of opinion and you don't get the difference resolved, then the husband, as the head of the home, rather than fighting about it, rather than throwing the frying pan, the husband is responsible to make a decision and the wife should abide by it and trust God with the results. Now, she doesn't abide by a sinful decision, no, or a decision that would cause her to violate her conscience. But uh, this is how you resolve conflicts. And we'll talk more about that next week, uh, the, or the next class. The bottom line is seek to please God by everything you say. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, 14.